Thank the member for Blair. The member for Menzies. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. And I also rise to speak on the Family Assistance and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2013. This is a bill from a Labor government that's not only lost its way, but lost what were bipartisan values of supporting families and helping parents. And I should say, uh, by way of rejoinder to the honourable member for Blair, who spoke in this debate before me, uh, this constant reference to the education bonus as if that was something completely new. Uh, what the government did was to replace uh, an old tax rebate with the education bonus. Most people who are in receipt of that bonus uh, would have been in receipt of it under the former system that had been put in place. But let me say in relation to this bill that the coalition does not support this government's continuing attack on families. The coalition will always stand up for Australian families. What this bill seeks to do, Mr uh, Acting Deputy Speaker, is to bury a change to the baby bonus with a range of other measures. So I will concentrate on what is the most significant part of this proposed legislation, namely the changes to the baby bonus. Because this bill seeks to implement Labor's change to the baby bonus announced in the 2012-13 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. The amount of the baby bonus for second and subsequent children who come into a family from the 1st of July of this year will be reduced under this bill to $3,000. This change will generally apply regardless of whether the child is born into the family, adopted by the family or entrusted to the family's care within 26 weeks of birth, for example, under a foster care arrangement. The baby bonus will continue to be paid at the rate of $5,000 for the family's first child and for each child who comes into the family in a multiple birth adoption or entrustment to care situation. Now let's put this in context. The baby bonus was introduced by the coalition in 2002 for the purpose of raising Australia's declining fertility rate. This was a direct policy as a result of the intergenerational reports which were instigated by Peter Costello when he was the Treasurer. And what those intergenerational reports pointed out, that in terms of the continuing economic growth of this nation, then we had to concentrate on three things, on population, on participation and on productivity. Labor has indeed repeatedly slashed the baby bonus in attempt to find savings. In the 2009-10 budget, Labor paused the indexation of the upper income limit of the baby bonus, fixing the income threshold at $75,000. In the 2011-12 mid-year financial and economic update, Labor paused the indexation of the baby bonus payment until 2014-15 and reduced the rate of payment from $5,437 to $5,000 per child. Now, what's interesting about this is even the language which the government uses about the baby bonus. This, as I said, was introduced as a measure to try and ensure that we retain somewhere close to a replacement fertility rate in Australia. Why was that important? Because Australia, like many other countries around the world, has been gradually suffering a declining fertility rate. If you don't have people, then you don't have the people to do the jobs that we're crying out for in this country at the present time. And if you don't have people, then you actually negatively affect the growth rate, the economic growth rate of the nation. And indeed, a whole series of historical studies have shown that at least a quarter of national economic growth, not just in Australia but elsewhere around the world, at least a quarter of national economic growth comes from population growth itself. So if your fertility rate is declining, if your population growth through natural means is declining, then that's going to have an impact at some stage on the economic uh, development, the economic prosperity, the economic growth of the nation. So this was a measure which was introduced to deal with that specific issue of fertility. But now when we hear the Labor Party discuss it, they talk about it in welfare terms and they treat it like welfare and uh, indeed not only treating it like welfare but actually making these cuts. 
Now, following the cuts that I've previously uh, indicated were made by the government, we warned that changes would further limit choice for mothers, particularly those who wish to stay at home either for a short or temporary period of time or for a period of time when their kids were growing up and going to school uh, and raise their children. The reality is that Labor is ideologically opposed to stay-at-home mums. For some reason, they've decided that mums shouldn't have a choice and should just go back to work or enter the workforce after having their baby. That flies in the face of the practical experience of so many families in Australia. The common income in Australia is one and a quarter to one and a half jobs, where one partner, maybe the male, maybe the female, is working full time and the other is working in a part time uh, or casual basis. And what families decide to do is to make arrangements over their life course as to their work and family arrangements. So let's be clear about why the government wants to slash this payment. The baby bonus slash and burn exercise is expected to provide savings of $505.9 million over the four years from 2012-13 to 2015-16. $505.9 million is therefore going to be taken from the pockets of Australian families, particularly those families which are having children uh, under this measure. That's half a billion dollars being ripped away from Australian families by this particular measure. This is nothing more than a cynical and cruel attack on families simply to help the Treasurer and Mr Swan make their burgeoning black hole smaller. A desperate measure of ripping half a billion dollars from Australian families in order to do something towards trying to provide a surplus which of course will never be delivered by this government. Now, it's often claimed that generous provisions that enable women to enter and remain in the paid workforce contribute to higher fertility levels. Hence, the Australian demographer Hugo argues that, and I quote, the international ranking of countries according to their fertility levels matches their ranking on the extent to which they facilitate the employment of mothers in the paid workforce and the extent to which a degree of gender equity applies within the family itself. And other researchers have reached similar conclusions. If one goes back and looks at declining fertility over the past century, beginning in the 1930s, Sweden introduced policies that enabled women to maintain their position in the paid workforce whilst having children. In the 1980s, the fertility rate climbed to just over two, leading some commentators to conclude that the reversal was due to the cumulative impact of public daycare, child benefits, parental leave, parents' rights to work part-time and other measures. These views were reinforced as female labour force participation soared to 81 per cent and the birth rate rose above replacement levels. But the growth was temporary, falling to the lowest rate ever for the country of 1.52 by the end of the century. Looking at the case of Sweden, it would appear that the birth rate related to the economic cycle and the impact of the so-called speed premium, whereby parents were entitled to the same income replacement for a second child born within 30 months of their first, irrespective of the level of income between the two births. The policy, therefore, would, would, would appear to have resulted in births being brought forward rather than a permanent increase in the number. So it remains important to promote public policy outcomes that boost fertility rates. Prior to the baby bonus being introduced, the fertility rate in Australia had fallen to less than 1.9 uh, children per woman. Uh, it requires uh, over two, uh, in round figures, 2.1 births per woman just to simply maintain a birth rate, to maintain a replacement birth rate for the population. So policies such as the baby bonus, along with other policies that were introduced by the Howard government, are critical to encouraging fertility, and our public policy should seek to maintain at least a replacement birth rate. People sometimes say, well, if you don't have a replacement birth rate, uh, then you can make up for it by way of immigration. But the problem with immigration in terms of fertility or your overall population, your birth rate, is that the average age of immigrants that come to this country are about the average age of the population, and so they age along with the rest of us in this country. 
Only, theoretically, if you could somehow attract a larger, very younger cohort of immigrants could you actually do some of the things which are being lost by a declining fertility rate. But the reality is we're in competition for those skilled young immigrants from all over the world, for other countries like Canada, the United States and elsewhere, and therefore you can't attract even that larger cohort of younger immigrants. We'll take the case of Singapore, which is a classic study of what happens to fertility rates once they go down. Recently, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Tony Tan, announced that the government would fund $50 million over five years to educate the public on family life. But what Singapore illustrates is that, having driven down the birth rate from uh, high levels in the 1950s and 60s, it's got down to a point now where it's uh, about 1.2 or 1.3, and despite a series of efforts over the last 10 or 15 years uh, with all sorts of inducements such as uh, health care, such as uh, accommodation uh, assistance, etc., despite all of those inducements, uh, it's very difficult to get the, the fertility rate up once again. And given that's a small, in some senses, closed society, it provides provides uh, an illustration, a case study, if you like, of what happens to a nation when the fertility rate drops below a certain level. And it seemed to me, from studies that have been carried out around the world, if your fertility rate gets below about 1.4 or 1.5, then it's extremely difficult to raise that fertility rate again, and therefore that has medium and long-term consequences for that society, for that country, one of which, as I indicated before, is a decline in what would have otherwise been the economic growth of the country. Mr uh, Acting Deputy Speaker, most governments have sought to provide economic support for families. Using the rhetoric of family-friendly policies, measures range from direct taxation and social security benefits to parental leave and flexible working hours. And these often have the twin objectives of encouraging fertility and supporting families to raise children. If you take a country like France, for example, that has a deliberate third child policy. Whereas Australia, for example, pays a bonus on the birth of each child, or at least it does currently, uh, and it won't uh, if this legislation passes, it will diminish that. But whereas Australia pays a bonus on the birth of each child, France pays a greater amount for the third and subsequent children. And this is in addition to parental and maternity leave and childcare and family allowances. And the interesting thing about France is that France is one of the few countries in the world that's actually maintained a birth rate somewhere close to replacement levels. And they've done by saying that where you actually increase the birth rate is where those families who are prepared to have more than two children or one child, those who are prepared to have three or four children, that's what's going to have a, the biggest effect in terms of increasing the birth rate of the country. The combination of these policies, as I said, uh, has meant that the birth rate in France is stabilised at about 1.9, which is one of the highest in the Western world. So public policy motives underpinned the coalition decision-making to introduce this measure in the first place and our approach to things like promoting the fertility rate, whereas Labor's policy approach, if you could call it a policy approach, is simply about politics. Ideologically opposed to stay-at-home mums, they're spending money they just don't have. So to them, this is a measure that attacks a group they've already, that, are, that they already oppose and helps them to scrape some more money to put towards their skyrocketing debt. The baby bonus payments made to families for subsequent births are important. The third birth particularly helps Australia's fertility rate. And let me say that our approach to parental support, the Coalition has a plan to provide a first-class paid parental leave system. We've announced that and we will deliver it. But recognising that some parents do stay at home with their child is equally important. And as I said earlier, families make arrangements not just from week to week or month to month. Most families make arrangements over the course of a lifetime in which one at least partner, if not both partners, move in and out of the workforce. And of course, they do that to balance their work and family commitments. This government has again sought to attack stay-at-home mums and therefore attack the decisions that many families make in relation to their own family arrangements. The coalition opposes this attack and therefore we will oppose this bill.